If you gave a preschool-aged boy some royal power, his own palace, and a staff of servants, or even make him an emperor, do you think that dynasty would survive? This is All Request History. If you've ever wondered about the history of, well, anything, you're in the right place. Subscribe here, then send us your request in the comments. If chosen, we'll produce, record, and post your history request. Thanks this time to Bombino Gaming 663 for requesting the history of the last emperor, Puyi. The emperor's full name was Ashian Jiro Puyi. He was born in Beijing in 1906. He was an emperor only three times, but really had no royal powers at all. His story starts at age two. He was declared the emperor of China in 1908, upon the death of the current emperor and empress. They both died under very suspicious causes, one day apart from each other. The empress was Dawaner Shizi. She was 73 years old, and her 38-year-old nephew was Emperor Guan Chu. It appears that they both died of poisoning. It's thought by many that Shizi poisoned her young nephew because she disagreed with his politics. With him out of the picture, there were many years for her to rule because two-year-old Pu Yi, he was the only next male heir. Of course, not realizing her own death the next day makes it even more suspicious and controversial. Because of all that drama, Pu Yi started his first reign as emperor of the Qin Dynasty in 1908, while his father Zhe Fang was actually in power. The new emperor, two-year-old Pu Yi, was dragged kicking and screaming from his parents to live in the palace at the Forbidden City in Beijing. After his coronation on December 2nd in 1908, there was no more crying for home. Even though he was emperor in name only, he had access to the entire palace, a staff of servants, and someone to cater his every need. He even had a staff member whose job was to blow on a spoonful of hot soup so the boy emperor would not burn his tongue. In 1911, when Pu Yi was only five years old, a revolutionary revolt against the Chen dynasty brought an end to the imperial system and it became the Republic of China. He and his staff were allowed to live in the palace in the Forbidden City, but when told about the revolt only a year later, he was age six, he denounced his own throne. In 1912, Yuan Shiki was elected as the president of the Republic of China. Yuan wanted to restore the Qin Dynasty as soon as he could and then declare himself the emperor. Knowing the two-year-old was no threat to his power, he allowed Pu Yi and staff to remain at the palace in the Forbidden City. Pu Yi hated the new ruler and knew that Shiki's intention was to put himself in power and not let anyone get in his way. In less than a year, Shiki declared himself the Emperor of China. But then, due to strong opposition and mounting revolts, he was not able to maintain his leadership for very long. Then, in less than four years, he died at the age of 57 of urinary disease. It's Pu Yi's second stint as emperor for only 11 days in 1917, when Imperial China was restored for only two weeks by the warlord Zhang Fon. That restoration was quickly reversed by Republican troops. Pu Yi and his staff lived in the palace. Now let's not forget that even though he was the emperor of China now twice, he's still just an 11 year old boy. With an 11 year old boy in charge of anything, no matter how he was raised or how refined he might be, there's still gonna be some mischief going on. Let's just say that there were some occasional childish pranks and behaviors happening at the Forbidden City. Recognizing this, when he turned 13, in 1919, Pu Yi decided to take things a little more seriously. If he was someday going to be restored to the imperial throne, he took on a tutor to help him learn reading, languages, and, well, maturity. The tutor was British scholar Sir Reginald Johnson. Sir Johnson lived at the palace and worked closely with Pu Yi, not only helped him become a better young man, but they also became very close friends. Now, it's common practice at old school royalty that men of power should have multiple wives. This is to assure that they receive a male heir. So now it was time for the refined and more educated Pu Yi to choose a wife at the mature age of 16. He was given several photographs to help him make his decision. He quickly chose 12-year-old Wen Shao. The consortium rejected her, but because he liked her so much, she could remain a concubine. You know, like kind of a secondary wife, like, well, you know. He then chose his official wife, Goblo Wanron. She remained his official wife until her death in 1946. 
He married three more times for a total of five in his life, and of course he did have countless concubines. In 1924, a Chinese warlord took over the Republic of China. Fen Yuxian was known as the Christian General. He developed the Articles of Favorable Treatment. These articles included betterment for Chinese citizens, but it also reduced Puyi to a private citizen. With no more loopholes to keep him in the palace, he and his wife moved in with his birth father, Zhe Fang, in Beijing and stayed only one year. Puyi, Wan Ran, and the staff moved to a palace called the Garden of Serenity. It was in Tianjin. Wan Ran had an addiction to opium, and even though it seemed like the Garden of Serenity would have helped in that situation, well, it didn't. It got increasingly worse, and their marriage had completely fallen apart. Puyi gave his full concentration on the restoration of China's imperial dynasty. Now, the political climate in China in the 30s was very unstable. There was conflict, power struggles, invasions, and threats of civil war, and many Chinese warlords ruled autonomously. In 1931, the Japanese took over the Chinese land called Manchura, and they renamed it Manhuko. Through diplomatic pressure and manipulation, they convinced Puyi that he could be restored as an emperor if he moved into the imperial palace in Manhuko. Puyi was now the emperor for the third time. However, because Manhuko was a sovereign state and was controlled by Japanese government and military, he was really just a puppet emperor and became a political pawn for the Japanese. His wife Wan Ron's opium addiction became unbearable for him and the staff. They remained at Manhuko for almost 10 years. Attempts of his assassination were not uncommon, and he was not even allowed to leave the palace without permission. His regular functions were boring public luncheons and appearances, and just to remain visible, you know, a puppet. He became restless and erratic. He attempted new religions and daily prayer, but as time went on, his madness increased. He would regularly order staff to be flogged if they spoke to him in a manner he didn't like. He even took on a habit of sexual relations with young staff members. There's one report of a page boy trying to run away from Puyi's advances, and he was captured by the staff. He ordered the page boy to be flogged, and he later died of his injuries. Now, after the breakout of World War II in 1941, Puyi followed Japan's declaration of war with the U.S. and Great Britain. But neither nation recognized Manhuko as a real governed state or any threat. On August 9th, however, it was attacked by the Soviet Union, and the palace was forced to vacate. Wanron was ordered to be left behind. She was captured and kept in prison, where she begged for opium and then died of starvation. Meanwhile, the Soviet Red Army captured Puyi's plane, and he was held prisoner for close to five years. After World War II, China was now the People's Republic of China, and the Qing Dynasty was just a distant memory. In 1950, Puyi returned to Beijing and was held in detention by the Chinese government for committing war crimes for working with the Japanese. Puyi gave up hope of ever ruling again and not being any kind of political threat. He was released to civilian life in 1959. Now at 53 years old, civilian life for Puyi was quite different from his royal childhood in the Forbidden City. He lived in a humble home and worked as a gardener. After a few years, he worked as a clerk in the Beijing Botanical Gardens. By 1960, he was considered politically rehabilitated by the Chinese government and got to work as an editor in a publishing house. From his childhood royalty to a puppet emperor and an erratic young adult, now his existence as a private Beijing citizen was a quiet, modest, and comfortable one. In 1967, at only 61 years old, he died of cancer as a Chinese civilian. His magnificent story is portrayed in the 1987 Best Picture Academy Award-winning film, The Last Emperor. Well, thanks for checking in. Are you curious? Please hit the subscribe button right here and then leave your request in the comments so you'll know when you're on All Request History.